Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. On the Cannonball River in North Dakota, Paul Mondolowski and his son chased a hairy humanoid that was eight to nine feet tall in their pickup truck. It ran as fast as a horse and leapt across the creek. The county on the Cannonball River north of Little Eagle is Sioux County. On to the next one. One night at around 10 p.m., a Native American woman, Hannah Shooting Bear, age 70, looked out of her kitchen window and saw a large, hairy shape silhouetted against the lighted windows of a nearby mobile home. It had a funny big head, almost as if it had horns, wide shoulders, its arms were up, and its hands curled down, and it was swaying back and forth. Hannah got her dogs outside, but they were scared and crawled away under a car. Hannah ran to the mobile home and alerted the occupants who searched outside, but all they noticed was the smell of a dead person. There were 28 sightings of a hairy humanoid around here within the next three months. Cecilia Thundershield, Dan Uses Arrow, and Albert Dog, all Native Americans, saw Bigfoot. Cecilia and Dan saw the Bigfoot come out of the woods and they fetched Albert, who with them saw it return to the woods. The creature had long arms almost to its knees and walked slouched over. This was in Little Eagle, South Dakota. On to the next one. At Elkhorn Butte, near Little Eagle, in Corson County, South Dakota, Lieutenant Verdolfo, a police officer for the Bureau of Indian Affairs, together with his two sons, Jeff Vo, 15, and another teenage son, and two other officers, Bobby Gates, and Selvin Arlen spotted a Bigfoot in the moonlight and two of the men began to walk towards it. Vo felt that no weapon of any type would be of any use against it and that he should just walk away as fast as possible. At that moment, Vo's 15-year-old son, Jeff, came rushing towards them shouting there was another Bigfoot on the scene and that Jeff had watched it through the infrared scope as it walked behind the men. The pursuit ended as they had no weapons to fight a Bigfoot eight to nine feet tall. On to the next one. Mr. and Mrs. Walter Chasing Hawk, while driving at night, saw green eyes in the vehicle's headlights. Thinking that it was a deer, Mr. Chasing Hawk got out with a rifle, but instead saw an eight-foot-tall Bigfoot. This was in Standing Rock Reservation in Corson County in South Dakota. On to the next one. At Alcorn Butte near Little Eagle, Mr. Verdalvo from the previous sighting and several other men had chased a hairy humanoid for several hours and finally had it surrounded by vehicles with their lights blazing. There was nowhere for it to go. The creature then vanished. Did the creature have the ability to become invisible as one witness, a rancher, heard a noise like someone let out a breath and pounding of feet running? But when he pointed his torch at the spot where the sound was coming from, there was nothing there. On to the next one. A Bigfoot was seen near Little Eagle in South Dakota. Three teenagers had seen a Bigfoot on a ridge 10 miles northwest of town. Their Jeep had stalled and they were walking back to town when they saw three black creatures that were about 10 feet tall. They were walking rapidly and upright on two legs. All three boys were seasoned hunters and were scared by what they saw and dived to the ground to watch without being detected. On to the next one. 
in Brown County in South Dakota. When I was a senior in high school, I was staying overnight at a friend who lived about eight miles north of the town where I lived, Aberdeen. It's very flat in this area, although it does start to get somewhat hilly just to the north of where my friend lived. Very few trees, just miles of open farmland, and very little population. He lived on a stretch of gravel road that extended about two miles west off Highway 281, and there were a few other farmhouses along the same road. My friend and I were sitting in his basement talking until it was quite late, about 2 a.m. It was a very nice spring evening, nice enough to keep the basement windows open for fresh air. We were both getting pretty tired and we were trying to talk somewhat directly so as to not wake the rest of his family upstairs. At some point, we heard some sort of screech or scream and we both stopped and looked at each other, wondering if we would hear it again. After a few seconds, we heard it again. My friend had lived in the area all of his life, and he said he'd never heard a sound like that before. It sounded like it was coming from 50 to 100 yards away, so we both went to the basement window and looked out. It's very dark in that area, with no street lights to speak of, but the moon was lighting up the surroundings somewhat. We couldn't see anything, but the sound continued for probably 10 minutes. It was a very strange sound, and I couldn't identify it as anything I had heard before. I asked my friend if it might be a fox or possibly a deer in pain. It almost sounded like it was in distress, but he didn't think it was anything like that. I can't really describe it. I just remember thinking that it was really strange that we couldn't pinpoint what it sounded like. What was really strange was my friend was quite the outdoorsman, and he was very used to the sounds around that area and attuned to the wildlife, but he was completely stumped as to what could be making the sound. It sounded like whatever this creature was, it was howling or something, but it was definitely not a dog or a coyote, since I've heard both, and it was definitely not any kind of farm animal. I had been a Bigfoot buff since I was a little kid, and I tried to tell myself it couldn't be one of those but the sound continued for a while, and then it stopped. I had a somewhat hard time getting to sleep that night, as the sound was still in my head, but after the initial 10 minutes, we didn't hear it again. If I remember correctly, we made a half-hearted attempt the next day to go and see if we could figure out what had made the noise, but we didn't find anything. Not that we looked very hard, I kind of forgot about the incident until I read some stories online and I thought I might report it. I have no idea what it was, but it's kind of a strange story. It was around 2 a.m., nice evening, probably around 60 degrees, on a moonlit night, near a farmhouse on open farmland, slow rolling hills, some small groupings of trees close to a watering hole for cattle. On to the next one. Bigfoot has reportedly been sighted near Greengrass, South Dakota. Between 7.30 and 8.30 in the morning, a group of youngsters spotted a large creature and two small ones on the bank of the Mora River. The young men, Wacy, Austin, Doyle, and Dustin Buffalo, and Francis Montero, were out looking for their horses when they spotted the creature on a cut bank near the old garbage dump. The boys hurried back home, returning with Vivian High Elk. I had my doubt, but I went with them, commented Vivian. When they reached the river, no creatures were visible, but one of the boys spotted a face looking out of some brush. They ran over to investigate, startling four of the creatures, two appearing to be adults and two young ones. The boys chased them up the river, before they headed north, the adult creatures reportedly were dark brown with lighter colored fluffy fringe around the face and a white or gray patch on the stomach. They had human or ape-like faces with oval eyes. The little ones were about the size of a 10-year-old child and the adults were very tall, estimated at 8 feet. They had big arms and were furry all over. There were tracks of some kind along the riverbank and a place where something had run or walked in the river itself. 
the boys reported that one of the creatures had been dragging some branches and dropped them in the river. There were some branches with green leaves in the river and evidently they had been dragged to the water with footprints along the path. The footprints were wider and longer than a human print with no arch to the foot and six widespread toes. The footprints sunk into the soft mud along the river deeper than a human's footprint the group was making next to them. On to the next one. My experience with a Sasquatch came as no surprise to me as my family has owned our ranch remote hunting lodge for a very long time. I won't mention precisely where it is, only that it is in the South Pallet River Valley. My brother and I grew up with the word lodge ingrained in our thinking. However, in actuality, our lodge is a very solid and attractive two-bedroom log cabin. Not that cabin makes it smaller, as we have a large living room with a river stone fireplace that takes three-foot logs. The year this happened, my brother Tom and I were ready for our annual deer hunt. But a week before, Dad fell and sprained his ankle while out sighting in his aught six. Even in a state of severe pain, Dad insisted that we still go on as planned. He just brought a box of reading material. So here we were, keeping up a 12-year tradition. Tim and I each had our favorite stands in opposite sides of the heavily treed and quiet tall hill that started rising about 300 feet behind the cabin and rose to a height around 600 or so feet. This hill became a round-topped ridge that stretched from our property line into a huge area of thickly covered slopes, short valleys, several crisscrossing creeks, and even several small ponds. The ponds were surrounded by cattails and had really soft bottoms. This was ideal country for deer, and normally we filled our three tags the first or second day. This year was different, and as the three of us sat in front of a toasty fire on the third night, we talked about what had changed. Two full days, and neither Tom nor I had spotted any deer. Had we not been what we feel are very experienced hunters, and having hunted in several states, we wouldn't have been so surprised. So, as we sat around licking our wounds, Dad mentioned that this was not so unusual at all, and in his much greater knowledge of the area and of shared experience from his father, our grandfather, he suggested we slightly alter our hunt on the morrow. Dad advised us to carefully watch the side trails, as our usual method was to be aware of deer tracks, but Dad wanted us to begin stepping off the obvious main routes and occasionally deviate to check out a few of the less traveled paths and most definitely the trails were fresh tracks that looked to be seldom, if ever used by a few animals. The next morning, Tom and I avoided our favorite routes and headed for an area further from our usual spot. Since the three of us most always had three bucks hanging by the second day, we had become spoiled and had seen little reason to sightsee. Besides that, in this heavily treed area dotted with meadows and streams surrounded by thousands of magnificent pines along with large forests of oak, elm, birch, and so much beauty, it is easy to become spoiled by such majesty. So, today seemed like we had a primary mission to analyze the hunting ground that we had so long taken for granted, and we couldn't accept the fact that the deer population was not what we had expected. So, where were they? The weather had not changed from the past years. Nothing seemed different from every previous hunt. So why? Tommy and I deviated by an extra half a mile to an area that we had never spent more than time to cross through to a resplendent mountain lake two miles beyond. When we reached a large, round-topped hill, about 600 feet high, we agreed to split and go in opposite directions and hunt around it with the knowledge that we would eventually meet, though so any shot would need to be at an angle away from the hill, enough to not endanger each other. 
The terrain was similar to where we hunted the days before, and it was about an hour since Tom and I split when I noticed a strange track off to the side of the trail on my right. It seemed as if to be that of another hunter, and there were more tracks all along the grassy area off to the side of the trail. I thought back to two days before Dad expanded our thinking and wondered if the same tracks may have appeared alongside some of the other animal trails I had walked. My mind dismissed the mystery as I made the assumption that it had been another hunter who had deliberately stepped alongside the trail to hide his prints from the deer, as though they could consciously recognize signs of human presence by their tracks. Dumb thought, I know. Anyway, I stayed on the more packed surface of the trail, occasionally glancing at the accompanying prints in the grass alongside until the grass thinned suddenly at a point where the recent rains had widened a crossing stream to have washed out the grasses and the footprints as well as the deer tracks on the main trail. Then, after crossing this washed out area, I observed a continuation of the deer tracks and off to the right, the human tracks. That's where I stopped dead in my own tracks. In the still wet sand, the tracks I had been following for the last miles were perfectly clear now and were bare footprints, perfectly imprinted in the damp ground were the largest footprints I had ever seen. Placing my size 12 hunting boot beside one of those prints, heel to heel, the other print was at least another six inches longer and three inches wider than my foot. Even with the extended soles of my hunting boot, the realization that a non-human creature of so much larger proportions had recently walked the same trail made me acutely aware that I may be in danger. My 30 6 carbine didn't feel as powerful in my hands as it did before. I decided to stay where I was until Tom came around to meet me, and I was about to find a place to sit when I heard a gunshot not far ahead. Figuring that my brother may have just succeeded in getting a deer, I'd reckoned I'd show my find as I helped him carry the deer back this way. So I trotted off in the direction of the shot, and ten minutes later, we were carrying a nice young buck between us, its legs tied to a long branch we held on our shoulders. My excitement in finding a track must have seemed to Tom to diminish his triumph in such a fine trophy, but once I had seen the large tracks, I had begun to envision what I just knew had to be the elusive Sasquatch. So it was difficult to be too enthusiastic over the deer. I spotted the stick I had shoved into the bank with my piece of orange plastic flagging signaling in the wind, and in my excitement, I almost dropped my end of the deer, as I told Tom to put it down and follow me to my discovery. We both covered the distance quickly, and as I stopped gasping for breath, I thrust my hand forward to point at my evidence, but the prints were gone. They had been brushed out by a pine branch that lay directly alongside the spot. It had plainly been used to sweep clean the tracks, and it was even more evident because the culprit had even erased my own recent footprints. Tom could see my frustration as I just stared in absolute shock when he said, Look. As I raised my line of sight to follow his pointing finger, I could plainly see a large brownish-gray figure climbing at a fast pace up the side of a steep hill. The creature was rapidly going up the steep slope on two feet while using its giant hands to reach out and grab the young forest of saplings to pull itself upward so fast that in seconds it had disappeared. We stared after the Sasquatch for several minutes without either of us saying a word. We arrived back at the lodge. Dad was standing on his crutches on the porch. He had seen us coming far away, and we remarked that he must have been out there the entire time. Having tied the deer's hind feet to the lower branch of the large apple tree in the front yard, we burst out with our story of the Sasquatch, figuring Dad would be shocked. Instead, he selected one of the wicker chairs on the deck 
and motioned us to take seats opposing his, which we did while exchanging curious looks between us. Then, after lighting his pipe, Dad told us that that was the reason why he wanted us to widen our tracking perspectives and become more aware of our surroundings. He went on to explain that he had noticed the same phenomena in seasons past as his own father had experienced before him. The Sasquatch were a nomadic group that occasionally seemed to be forced by extremely cold weather to leave their higher mountain retreats to move down into the surrounding valleys. He went on to say that our property abutted the main series of valleys directly below their exit route. These creatures were never observed by any of our neighbors because our land effectively shielded these big furry guys, as Dad called them. He told us he'd never mentioned them before to us because, in his words, I'm paraphrasing here, you clowns would have had every lug-headed, dumbfelled friend of yours up here and ruined an entire population of survivors of some long-forgotten race of creatures that may have even been our ancestors. He went on to say that our great-great-grandfather may have been one of them, then, with a huge grin, he continued, Why, that one you saw today? It could very well be your distant cousin. Strange as it sounds, I wonder. I can still hear Dad laughing. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day. So be sure to hit that notification bell and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much and until next time, bye!